That Great Business Show, Ireland's Best Business Podcast. That Great Business Show.com is brought to you by De Facto Shaving Oil, the best anyone can get. Made in Ireland, sold worldwide. Welcome to episode 80 of That Great Business Show, posting on the 25th of March 2022. I am Conal O'Moran. I was delighted that we were mentioned in the Sunday Times with our interview with Petrel Resources Chairman David Horgan, who was on the past episodes, that's episode 79. If you want some proper, real-world analysis on the state of the world's energy markets, David actually knows what he's talking about. And yes, what David has to say is bleak. It's the energy world as he sees it. On a lighter note, I was recommending episode 15 of That Great Business Show to someone yesterday. If you're a newbie to this podcast... We're adding hundreds of you every week. You should go back and listen to Irishman Connor McEnroy, owner of Paraguay's fifth largest bank, Kidnappee and Recent Dad. His story is almost unbelievable, but true and fun. This week, though, we have two very different stories, but loads and loads of great business insights and tips brought to you, as always, thanks to our sponsor, De Facto Shaving Oil, the world's best all-natural shaving oil. In a minute, I'll be talking to an industry leader who has completed a college course on mortars, renders, and concrete. But more importantly, this chartered engineer wants to see more women in the construction and engineering sector. And my second guest will explain how he left school early to grow a business with a 50 million euro turnover and a thousand employees as you do oh and he wants to do it all again de facto shaving oil smooth as i'm pretty sure that we will be the only podcast probably in the world that this week will discuss ground granulated blast furnace slag yes it's a thing but that's the thing about the great business show we do business differently And my guest, who cannot wait to chat about GGBS, as she refers to it, is engineer Susan McGarry, who for two years now has been CEO at family-owned Ecosem. They're makers of a cement substitute that is a 95% lower carbon footprint than the regular stuff. And you may well have walked on it or sat on it because it's been used in prestige projects like the National Conference Centre and the Aviva Stadium. Ecosem was founded in 2003, but many of you in business will appreciate the company. It took a long time to gain traction. Its founder, Don Lorian, admits they were just too early to the party, but it looks Like now is their time. They've raised 22.5 million euro. They have a relatively new CEO that I mentioned, and they're gung-ho for growth. Susan McGarry, CEO of Ecosem, welcome to that great business show. Thanks, Kauno. That was some introduction. Ground granulated blast furnace slag, or GGBS as I will always call it from now on. What is that? It's a tongue twister. (laughs) <laughs> it is That's what it is at the very least. So GGBS is a byproduct from the steel industry. So it comes from our partners who we've partnered with since 2009 in France, our Cellar Metal. Um, so we get our raw material from the, the steel company uh, during their iron making process. Um, it's a byproduct that's quality controlled quite rigorously, even though it would technically be a waste to the steel organisation. Um, we take that in its granulate form. So it comes out as molten slag. They quench it with water jets just for movement and storage. We put that in a boat. We bring it over to Ireland. We dry it. We grind it. And that makes cement. And then do you ship it out again? We ship it out again in Ireland. So I'm the managing director of Ecosum Ireland. And we export to the UK about forty to 50,000 tonnes per year. Um, and the rest of it, it, we sell to the domestic market here in Ireland. Now, it wasn't you who set it up, but you do know the back history very, very, very well, well because you've been with the company 10 plus years. It's been a slow takeoff. Yeah, yeah. So it was founded in 2003. So the Irish company and the Dutch business were set up roughly around the same time. Um, in Ireland, traditional cement is uh, SEM1 or SEM2 is the technical name, but it's it's ordinary Portland cement. So it's been Made around. by one of those big bad people that we won't mention their names. I wouldn't say that. <laughs> there's, there's four different cement companies on this island. So they all produce ordinary Portland cement. Um, the technology hasn't changed much in a hundred years. Uh, we've a slightly lower carbon version where there's 80% of the polluting side of it and then about 20% replacement with limestone just to lower the carbon footprint. Um, so that's 
that's the dominant cement in the market. So to get ours in play here was a door-to-door process. It was already used in Europe quite a bit, but it was brand new to Ireland at the time. And you were telling me just now that you went door-to-door, literally into the architect's offices, presumably the engineer's offices, anybody who specs a building. Yeah, that's a huge part of the work that I do. My technical manager, my sales manager, business development manager, there's a, there's a, a full team in Ecosem Ireland that has always done this work where we have direct customers who are the concrete industry and we have indirect clients then who are everyone else, as you mentioned, that specifies concrete and designs concrete. So architects especially love it because it gives the concrete a whiter look and a more polished finish. The engineers like it because it has a higher long-term strength. It has increased durability. It has all of these engineering properties that allowed them to to produce a higher quality concrete, basically. And you love it because it keeps you employed. That's it. And how many other people does it keep employed? So in EGSM Ireland, we have 30 employees. So we have a production plant in Ringsend um, since 2003. And then we have our, our offices as well nearby. So we have 30 people here in Ireland and close to 200 in the EGSM group, which is across Benelux, France, the UK. Um, we have 15% of of the group is employed in research and innovation. It's a huge area for us at the moment. And you've raised, as I mentioned, over 22 million. So that's obviously going to be used with, for what? That investment came purely based on our future technologies and the the technical capabilities that we have. It goes far beyond the GGBS that we currently produce. See the way that you're just talking to me about GGBS and I know what you're talking about. It's just a normal word to you now. (laughs) And normally we would say no to acronyms, but in this case, I'm not going to say ground granulated blast furnace slag again. No, I I've wouldn't it try. Often. It's been shortened to slag in some state, in some places, but I think it doesn't have the same air to it that no, GGBS it has. No, yeah. no, we won't go down that route. The, I presume it's all wrapped up in IP and that you're all protected because this is clever stuff that yeah. you make. Yeah, so we've really pivoted in the past couple of years from we were just a direct sales of GGBS to the concrete producers and they made the concrete as they saw fit and for whatever specification that came their way, that could be 50% GGBS in combination with cement or up to 70%. Whereas over the past, I'd say over the past five years, the research and development that we've started across Europe has made us the leaders in low carbon solutions to the cement industry. So we're going beyond just supplying GGBS. We're now supplying technical expertise, innovation experts, concrete technologists that can go in and get the absolute most out of any concrete mix. And then we've also moved into so many other different applications. Basically, anywhere that you can use cement, you can use GGBS now. Um, That could be mortars. It could be screeds. We've got the lowest carbon concrete ever produced in Europe has gone into the Grand Paris and the Athletes Village in Paris now. That's about 70 kilos of CO2. um, As opposed to? As opposed to traditional Portland cement would have about 803 kilos of CO2 per tonne. So, so, it's, it's, less than so it's 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 tiny compared to your traditional Portland cement. But the problem that we have now and that are, are not that we have, that the world has at the moment and that we're working on developing is a lot of these really, really ultra low carbon solutions that you have aren't necessarily scalable to the size that we need to produce mass concrete, to build your bridges, your large scale commercial developments. So we're working on scalable ultra low carbon solutions that can eventually replace your traditional Portland cement. And I have to find out when is this going to happen and how are you going to do it? It's going to be within the next two to five years, we're going to see a real shift in the market um, because we've been working on this for years. We've, we, we openly look for partners that want to develop things like this. Like we are, we are one player, but if you, if you partner with somebody else, a, a bigger guy and come to pull, pull your expertise, you can develop this a lot quicker and roll it out a lot faster. So these things are happening and everything we're producing at the moment. So each each new technology that we come out with now is a stage in the process. Where is your R&D done in Ireland or throughout the group? It's or? done across the group, but we do have a centre of excellence in Paris, in Champlain in Paris, that we just opened last year. And that's not by chance that you have a Paris uh, location. Don Lorian lives... He lives in Paris, Paris. yeah. yeah. Not a bad place to live, but I mean, uh, he's, put in, he's put in the hard yards. That's it. Maybe I'll get there soon. <laughs> <laughs> and I presume it keeps you awake at night dreaming of how big the market can be. Because, well, sorry, I want to go back one step. As a kid, I mixed concrete by hand. I know a lot about concrete and burning the hands off myself and stuff like that. 
Tell the world the difference between cement and concrete. Cement and concrete. Cement is a constituent of concrete. This is an ongoing pet peeve of everyone in EcoSem and says, look at that, look at that cement trunk, Tr- look at that cement trunk and it'll be like the rolling bottle of concrete. And you're like, no, that's concrete. Or you're walking on the cement pavement. No, that's concrete. So the, the hardened state that you walk across something or the block that you put in, that's concrete. The, Full of aggregate. Exactly. So and your stuff concrete, sticks it all together. This is it. Concrete's made of cement, sand, aggregates, water. And the cement component we'd refer to now as binder because it's not just cement. It's cement plus GGBS. Okay. To create a binder. Okay. So the great, good, the fantastic news for you is, should the world adopt, and I'm sure they will, EcoSAM, the market is just ginormously vast. It's massive. It's it's far bigger than we could ever supply ourselves. Uh, we'll try to get a nice portion of it, but the technologies that we're developing are global solutions to a carbon problem and but to the could climate you crisis. sell on the the knowledge yep. yeah so you yeah, can you yeah. can become an IP yeah. company as this well. is this is probably where we're going to end up most likely with the technology that we've developed it's not something that like we we're at whatever capacity we can get to to make it the solution that it needs to be for the current climate crisis we need to give that to other people we need to give that knowledge to other people so create a technology that's open source to an extent Obviously, we can make our business out of it as well. A little license fee there somewhere. A little license fee or something like that, um, but that everyone has access to this. And anyone that's willing to work with us and partner with us to help develop this, like we're arms open, come and work with us. We're nice people. And speaking of, you would like many more women to join you as well. And as you know, as I was explaining to you, we are very keen on gender balance on this uh, podcast and at the moment, the numbers going into engineering, women going into engineering is down at 8 or 9%. Is that what yeah, I read? Yeah. yeah, it's quite low. It's a bit odd. It is. And there hasn't been that much change in 10 years. And a lot of, I th- well, I see maths being blamed for that. Yeah. Is that a fair blame? Um, I've, I helped found the Women in Engineering group within Engineers Ireland. It's kind of, Shocking that there wasn't a separate group, but there wasn't, right? I suppose you shouldn't have needed one, but exactly. you did, but you did but need we one. We did yeah. need one because what I found from my personal experience and I from, from meeting other women engineers, I know this to be true, the more senior you get, the more lonely it becomes. There's less and less people like you around you. And that can affect every aspect of your career because you're hearing group think from a group that you are not the same as. So their opinions and their advice and all of that, while it might be great advice for them or for somebody like them, it's not necessarily how you think or what's best for you. So to have a network around you of like-minded people, similar kind of, it's not even similar background, it's just a similar sort of thought process or experiences because we do have a different experience. Women engineers do have a different experience to male engineers. Um, so if somebody can relate to that a little bit and say, well, this is what I did in that situation. So having a network around you becomes more and more important, the more senior you get. And what we found out from kind of doing the networking events and research is that there's a percentage of women graduating from engineering courses that doesn't tie up with the percentage of women in engineering. So where are they going? There's a drop off. They drop through a crack to they, where? We don't know. And there's a lot of research going into this and that the... But it was, see, they could be being gobbled up by the Googles and the Facebooks and all. There's potentially a proportion that just say, hey, this isn't for me. That's fine. But, but, there's but that'll a, be also true of uh, men or... Yeah. Yeah. But males. you've got such a low percentage going in that you need to protect the ones that are and try and keep the pipeline there, you know, because if you can see it, you can be it. So you want a pipeline of things coming through so you can get more and more senior women engineers get more and more women on boards, all of that. So protect what's going into the pipeline and making sure that their lived experience isn't something negative. And that's what we've found anecdotally. That put put lived, words around that. What do you, what do you explain, explain that to me? Graduate engineers going in, female engineers are having sometimes negative experiences at the beginning of their career because it can be a confidence issue. Um, it can be a pay issue. We've heard that happening still to this day, um, that the male intake got paid a slightly higher salary than the 
It's fascinating. Yeah. And it is that fascinating, can, isn't that it? That is genuinely down to confidence in a lot of situations because it can be the interaction in the interview, in the first interview. I'm not going to ask for this much. Like, I don't, oh, I shouldn't. I'm not But able. if they're hiring John and Mary, mm. a good company should say, John and Mary, you're getting the exact same. You're doing the same job. Yeah. That's why the gender pay gap reporting is very important. So that's going to become a legal requirement. It's, it's, it's staged at different size companies. So it's, it's at the larger end right now. And it's, it's going to get closer and closer to, to all companies having to report on this. And that is literally looking at you pay your, it's not person by person. It's illegal to do that. You know, if someone's doing the same role, you, they shouldn't be on different salaries. But if you look at it grouped, these are all the, the guys. These are all the girls. What's the difference there? If there's that much of a difference, there's a problem. So this is this is the key thing that for me, because I, I quite like talking to the college graduates or the just about to leave college. It's just there's just so much opportunity in front of them, right? The world's at their feet and you want to tell them what a great career they can have. And then you're hearing that there's like something negative happening in their first early years that if someone reached out to them and said, hey, this is OK, I went through this. You just got to speak up or maybe try doing it this way it can change that person's entire career trajectory by getting that early engagement and keeping them on board. Has it got anything to do with the teaching of maths in secondary schools? Um, I don't think it's about the teaching of maths. I think it's about the lack of awareness of what a technical career is and why maths would be important to that technical career. And if you had your magic wand and you're slowly working your way towards it, (laughs) what would you do to change things? Um, I think it's a Department of Education issue. I think that something needs to be put into the curriculum around STEM careers. I don't think it can just rely on the steps to engineering program with Engineers Ireland, which is fantastic. It has to go beyond that. This is a systemic issue. Do you know who I'm hoping, because I've tried a few times to have her on, is uh, on the podcast is a woman called Nikki Daly. I don't know whether you know Nikki. She is an Ireland, Ireland international hockey player, but she also has a big background in motor racing. And what she's doing is a thing called Formula Female, and she's teaching transition year kids or that about that age, women, uh, young women, uh, how to fix and have fun with engines. And I just think that is, I've, that's why I'm so keen to have her on. I think it's such a clever idea. Those types of things give girls a glimpse of, oh, that is something I do. It's not because you grow up with it from the earliest age with these are boys toys and this is a boys game that you don't, you end up getting excluded from stuff that you might have a natural knack for. Like I have an analytical brain. I know I have that now, but but I wouldn't have known it then. But how did you get into engineering yourself? So I wanted a practical career. That was always my thing. I wanted to be doing things all the time. I'm very project based. I like getting involved in stuff and you're not just sitting there on the same thing every day. And I always, always had an environmental streak in me. I was always a keen environmentalist, like a member of Greenpeace as a kid and everything. Like just, it was always something that interests me. So I ended up going into the civil engineering degree in Bolton Street and turned every project I did and everything that we had to work on into an environmental thing. And I just made my own kind of degree out of it in that way and had a real environmental focus. I graduated in 2011 in the worst recession to hit the construction industry and everybody left. But you didn't. I didn't. Why? I had applied for a Canadian visa. I had sent out hundreds of CVs and there was just nothing happening. There was no, because there was no work. And one job came up as a marketing intern with a low carbon cement company. And I was working in my part-time job in a pharmacy going, okay, I'll just throw it in here and see what happens. I'm not in marketing, but it's low carbon cement. I love it. What a great backstory. Please remind me, you're now in charge. <laughs> no, I'm 11 years director. later, odd. Yeah, yeah. So just to recap, you're sitting at home or in the pharmacy and you see a marketing job, nothing mm-hmm. to do at all with engineering. I love that. Yeah. And I always say to people, you know, take the opportunity. Just take the opportunity. I got in there and I made myself as useful as possible. And I just And I so put words on that. I mean, tell it to me or tell the listeners, what did you, what would you have done to make yourself useful? More than cups of tea or whatever. Yeah. So the, the one thing that I say to when I'm doing any of the women engineering talks or trying to, or even with the, the kind of school age girls is engineering is the best degree you can ever get because it teaches you skills that are applicable to absolutely any business, right? So you have analytical skills, critical thinking, you can do report writing, you can do, you've got 
the ability to do presentations because it's drilled into you. All of these things become really, really useful for just any business. You become the person that will fix up a PowerPoint presentation. You become the person that will set up an Excel spreadsheet to do market research. All of these little things while learning about the business and going, okay, what else could I do? Or what other suggestions could I make? And I ended up, because I had such a keen interest in the environmental side of things, that I started saying things about the plant. Can we make the plant more sustainable? Is there anything we can do here? Like I brought in ISO, environmental management systems. Um, we had la- We were launching a new product at the time. We launched bagged cement, bagged Ecosem in 2013. We no longer produce that at the moment. Um, but it was a new mark product on the market at the time. And I became the technical manager for it for, on a small scale. But it was just dealing with general com- general issues or calls that came in because we'd never dealt with the the everyday DIY guy or like the small builders. It was always, you know, large scale concrete users. So that was like small questions and stuff like that. So I was using my concrete technology from engineering, like just applied every single thing I'd ever learned. I was trying to think, what, what how can I use this? How, what can I do? Um, the company itself played a critical role in it. So I worked for Conor O'Reen, who is the European Managing Director now and the son of Donald O'Reen, the founder. Um, So Conor gave me every opportunity and said to me, you know... But he gave you an opportunity because presumably he saw something in you. Absolutely, yeah. And still does. And that's why I, I am where I am today because like I've never managed a business before. Yes, I've been in the company for 10 years, but... I hadn't that direct general manager experience and took a chance on me. Now, it's paid off, I think. I'd like to say it has. Um, so that really gave me a push. So my thing with people, telling people about kind of taking opportunities and all that, you have to think about what's the company like and company culture and a company that's going to take care of you and wants to develop people. You're not just an additional body in the in the organization. They're going to, you're you're this human that likes to do this type of work, you're good at this. Okay, let's take that and try and promote it and, and work with you to develop it. And I've tried to do that with everyone that I've employed since because it's so important. Like we have an internship program that we run every summer where we'll hire somebody into the lab. We might hire somebody on the sustainability team. You're going to get a lot of applications. <laughs> <laughs> because you sound such a great company to work for. How many people do you take on in interns uh, per annum just in Dublin? Say? Just in Dublin, between two and three. Okay. Yeah. So we do a lot of transition year ones as well. There's usually one transition year per year as well. That's just, you know, one to two weeks. Give them give them a bit of an insight into each of the different organizations, have them work with accounts one day uh, down the plant another day. But we've uh, a technical role every summer to help in our lab on research and development. The um, sustainability side, there's always something there. And then if somebody else comes along that we think that's a good candidate that we'd like to give an opportunity to. If Ecosem has 30 people in Ireland and 200 across the group now, yeah. where are you going to bring it? And I mean, where are you going where to bring it? Where am I going to bring it? Yeah. It's a loaded question. It's a loaded <laughs> question. So my goal is innovation in Ireland and my goal is to change the face of the industry here. We, ah, we need, okay. that'll we be, need to change. That'll be done on Tuesday. Yeah. Yeah. We need to change. What needs to change? Cement is 4% of Ireland's greenhouse gas emissions. It hasn't changed. It's not going to change unless it has to change. The concrete producers that buy cement and GGBS from me, they're very forward thinking. They do everything they can to provide the specs that are being driven by the private sector, the specifications that the architects that want the ultra low concrete, the engineer that wants the strongest concrete. They're doing that. They're producing low carbon concrete. But the cement that's available on the market hasn't changed. It's either high polluting cement or you buy GGBS. So the cement industry has an opportunity here to be the change in the industry and start producing these low carbon cements. Are you getting pushback? Um, No more than anyone else would when it's, it's it's a fundamental business change. But like... This is happening across Europe. But what, it's so a way. There's an opportunity here for there's, a well-known brand, a uh, very large corporation, to grasp this and to yeah. run with it. Yeah. And across Europe, that is happening. That is happening. Ireland's a, a little bit slower to change. The construction industry here is a little bit slower to change. Um, and in some ways, it's because we're careful. And that's okay. 
Um, but I think when you present the facts and the technology that's out there, it's a good business decision and it does take time to do it. But I think the want is there now and the um, urgency of the situation, I think, is becoming apparent to, to d- the wider public and the industry itself. So government policy is a big part of this. We had the Climate Action Plan 2021 has been published. Um, Cement falls under the Department of Enterprise. And they have made a special um, like focus on the clinker component of cement, which is the, the main polluting component. So when you excavate limestone and shale, you burn it to very high temperatures in a kiln, you produce clinker. It's the main component of cement. It's responsible for 90% of the concrete's carbon. So it's very limited what the concrete guys can do to lower their carbon when the cement is what it is. So the fact that it's written into the government's climate action plan, hey, this is a target area. This needs to be addressed. That just shows you how much we've changed. Like it's out there now. The message is out there. Like nobody would have been talking about clinker being a problem a few years ago, whereas now the focus is here. The, there's mandates in other European countries already that you have to use low carbon cements. So the cement industry has changed to produce these low carbon cements. We're partnering with them across Europe to say, we've got technology, we can work with you. That is happening. Um, so that's what I want to happen here in Ireland as well. That's my goal. Can Ecosem become the European leader? I mean, it's a big, big, big ask. And I'm not even talking necessarily about pure size. I mean, it's a vast industry, yeah. but being the thought leader. Yeah, and that's really where I think we've always been the most outgoing and publicly facing company to talk about climate change in this industry. But it's definitely become more and more of a focus of, of, our, of our entire group policy to get out there and spread the message. It's nearly like a responsibility on us that you have to spread this message. You have to get the word out there. It's why I do the podcast with you. It's why I do the talks. I'm at the Green Building Council's conference. It's these kind of things that you have to be out there talking about them. Um, And there's a lot more conversations happening now as well. At a European level, we're being asked more to give our feedback on situations and, and what can happen. And is there a cost to being green and getting rid of old concrete or old cement? There's a cost in term, and it's a lot less than what the alternative is. So the alternative is the cement industry have kind of a limit to the amount of change they can make until the new technologies come on board, such as carbon capture and storage and green hydrogen. Now the dates for those are like 2030 and beyond potentially. Between now and 2030, they're limited in what they can do. We could think it can reduce by maybe 1% the carbon emission, the total carbon emissions from the industry, maybe 1% per year until 2030. That's it. So to do the new technologies, the carbon capture and storage, the green hydrogen, that's going to cost money because it's huge investment. These are massive new technologies. That's going to come with such a high premium that the cost of cement is going to go through the roof. So the cost of concrete, the cost of construction, that's going to have a knock-on effect. Whereas what we're saying is, if you reduce the overall clinker that you're producing now, you're going to make much bigger differences in the amount of carbon you're producing overall. Therefore, your reliance on the carbon capture and storage and green hydrogen will be reduced. If I go down to a well-known brand and say, give us a, a meter, a square meter, a, a cubic meter, I think, of concrete versus a cubic meter of Ecosem, uh, finance, financially, what's the difference roughly in a percentage? Roughly, no difference. There can be a, a bigger um there can be a bigger difference if there's, say, an architectural requirement for 70% for a really, really white concrete or special care to be taken around that, around the finishing. But that's specking. Or that's right, more yeah. around... That's kind of, and stuff. It's, yeah, it's more around the care of it and stuff like that. That can have. But what we're seeing now is just prices increasing across the market, across all construction materials. And the demand for our product has increased so much, as in the raw material that makes our product. The demand has increased across Europe because of the low carbon wave, that everybody wants this low carbon material, and that in turn can drive the price up. But still, it's kind of in relative to cement terms, very little difference. Next steps for Ecosem? For me, personally, in Ecosem Ireland, next steps would be to develop our current 
uh, innovation products. So we do a couple of different things. We do super fine GGBS, which is... Ah, the old super fine GGBS. Super I was fine. wondering when yeah. you were going to mention it. Uh, that makes ultra high performance concrete. It's a, it's a higher grade GGBS. So we're trying to expand that market right now. We currently export a lot of that to France as well. We're the only ones in the group that produce it. Um, and we're trying to develop further. Some of the other applications that we've been in, there's there's 50% GGBS blocks out there that we can't keep up with demand. Our customers are getting calls from architects all over the country trying to provide these. So growing that market, dry mix mortar, which is your mortar silos that would be on the all the residential development sites. That's a huge area for us. It, we had never, there was never low carbon mortar before until 2020. We produced 35% GGBS in dry mix mortar with Kilcarry Quarries, our customer. And we're trying to drive that up now to 50% and get an ultra low carbon mortar available for residential building. Aside from that, it's policy and driving policy change. A big part of my role is driving policy change and in trying to influence and give the information, the, the unbiased information of this is a low carbon material that is available here in Ireland. We need to maximise it. It's being exported by other, by other companies into the UK because the UK has a, has a low carbon mandate. But we don't have a low carbon mandate here. Like, so it's, there's companies prioritizing other markets over our own market because we haven't mandated it. So I'm really trying to push for that change. You love your job. I do. Yeah, I'm very passionate. You've got a twinkle in your eye. <laughs> and I was thinking if you had been stuck, to, stuck with the pharmacy, what would you be thinking? <laughs> I'd be selling tan and chatting all day. Sometimes I miss it. It was such a social job. You'd just be having conversations all day and drinking tea. Your last question, Susan McGarry, CEO of Ecosem, is who would you hire in a heartbeat? I know you want a name because I've listened to the other episodes. I'm all of them? 79 episodes? Not all 79. No, no. no I might have gotten to about 70. Um, <laughs> so my general answer is I'd hire any of the women that I met in the Women in Engineering Group in Engineers Ireland because I have never been as inspired as I have been since that group was founded a year ago and doing those networking events. Um, it's the first time that I've ever been in a room with all female engineers, a room, a virtual room, I should say, um, with all female engineers where we were able to have open conversations and chats about what do you wear when you become a senior manager in engineering? Because often you have to go on site so you can't be in a high heel and a business suit because you look impractical and that draws attention. So That's what's a fair a, question, isn't You know, it? yeah, it's these yeah. general questions that I had that every woman has had, but you have nobody to ask them to. So it's the first time that I was able to have those they sound silly, but yet they're kind of important to your overall confidence and performance in the role. Like that you, if you feel good, you look good, you're going to do a better job. Um, so the inspiration that I've gotten from a lot of those women, I'd hire, like I just would hire a female engineer now in a heartbeat. But if you had to push me for a name. Uh, which I'm going to. Okay, so I think I'd hire somebody really high profile that would draw a lot of attention to the cause, right? And get people to listen that this industry needs to change. Leonardo DiCaprio, get him to do a kick-ass documentary on carbon emissions in Ireland and what we need to do to change. I think that would be would certainly be, be great. very different. Yeah. People would watch it. <laughs> they I certainly mean, would. I've spoken about very technical topics here that would bore people to tears. So get someone Not interesting so. to talk about it. No, no, because that was what you were talking about is really interesting. What I mean, it's the future, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I have to give a shout out to, to my niece, who's relatively recent uh, engineer, Mida Nichnohur. I can't remember which company she works with, but uh, she's moving up the greasy pole as we speak. So Very she might good. be taking over EcoSem herself. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Susan, Susan McGarry, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Susan is, as I mentioned, CEO of EcoSem. And if you're specking, or certainly if you're an engineer or an architect, do spec EcoSem local. And it's really good for the environment. Susan, thanks so much for joining us on That Great Business Show. Thank you, Colin. Make one small switch. Switching from shaving foam to all-natural de facto shaving oil will give you the smoothest, softest shave ever. Switching from shaving oil to de facto helps stop 20 million non-recyclable shaving foam cans go to landfills every year. Switching from shaving oil to de facto will save your skin, your pocket and your planet. DeFactoShave.com 
Everyday accounting can be a bit of a drama for SMEs. However, BigRedCloud.com takes the drama away with its simple and easy to use cloud-based accounting and payroll software designed for SME owners. Raise and send invoices, manage VAT reports and obligations, run management reports, link directly to Irish banks, automatically import purchase invoices and so much more. All with five-star customer support. BigRedCloud.com, 100% Irish owned and a proud member of Team GBS. Small businesses often find it difficult to access the finance they need. Microfinance Ireland, the government-funded, not-for-profit lender, can help. We help businesses who have been unable to secure finance from banks or other lenders. We provide business loans up to €25,000 to businesses of less than 10 employees with a turnover of up to €2 million. Euro. For more information, visit microfinanceireland.ie or talk to your local enterprise office. Microfinance Ireland, funding small businesses in times of recovery and opportunity. All that great business show advertisers are Team GBS approved. Back them. There's a very nicely written article about a man called John Tuhi that was written for the Sunday Times by Laura Roddy on the Upod website. Upod says you? Yes, Upod says I. Upod is a new company that offers a click and collect service for smaller businesses. Founder John Tuhi has a brilliant backstory, leaving school early, putting 10,000 old pounds of redundancy money into a business called Nightline that was sold just a couple of years ago to UPS for a mere 30 million euro. And John had a very healthy 40% cut of that. I'll get to John's story eventually, but Upod is really, really interesting for anyone in business and for those of you who can see around corners, as they say, because it may well have other as yet unforeseen applications. John Tuhi, welcome to That Great Business Show. Thank you, Connell, for having me. Before we start, I said I wouldn't go to your backstory, but I have to be. You've just told me one fascinating story. You were in Chanel College here in Dublin and once a month, uh, your uh, careers or maybe lack of careers teacher came in and gave you the following advice. What was he advising you to do? Uh, well, there, was a, there was a kind of a special lesson once a month. Nine. This would have been in 1985. And uh, the, the lesson was on uh, preparing ourselves for uh, long-term unemployment. And as you were saying to me, that's very, very positive, isn't it? It wasn't, yeah, it was very hopeful. And, uh, you know, I suppose... In the in the eighties, I suppose eighty five was an interesting year, wasn't it? It was the year of Live Aid, and then eighty six we had Self Aid. So there was a there was this sort of uh, there was long high unemployment, high interest rates, very little stimulation in the economy, and a burgeoning educated young workforce. And I think those there was those statistics around that used to bounce around the eighties that we had the youngest, the most the youngest population in the Correct. EU. I think it was yeah. the highest number of people under the age of twenty five, and, and the biggest stuff. number probably going to London just to earn a crust. Absolutely, I mean if people were getting a good education and heading elsewhere to put it to use, London or Australia or New York or wherever it was. But uh, yeah, that was that, that was the thing. And uh, but I haven't said that. Uh, and, and you know, people say to me now, uh, you know that you, know, you speak to young people say, oh look, you know, I want to leave school. Look, at you, you didn't do you any harm. But my advice to young people now is uh, is really try and stay in education for as long as you can. I wish I I, I could have, you know. You did all right. Come on, now alone have you collected big, and you had a lovely. Simple but lovely idea, but you're now going to do it again because we're now. I want to get straight on to Upad before we get sidetracked. I am the worst person to go down rabbit holes. Mm-hmm. Tell me all about Upad. Tell me your passion. Okay, so 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 Upad really is uh, a number of ideas that I had from my previous company, which part of the business I sold to UPS in in, in 2017 was uh, Parcel Motel, which was a, a really successful business. It was a parcel locker business and we had lockers placed at uh, petrol stations and convenience stores around the country. And uh, customers could order online and have the parcels delivered to the parcel locker. And it was really successful. But when I left, uh, when I left the company after I sold in 2017, there was more than 10% of the population had the parcel hotel account of 530,000 subscribers. Wow. So it was a very successful business. And but I had lots of ideas that I wanted to expand, you know, to continue to grow that business. And uh, but UPS came along and bought it in the meantime. And then I had a uh, contractual restrictions on 
uh, been in business for a couple of years after that. So now I'm back to execute some of those ideas. And what Oopod really is, is... Well, first, first of all, the name, it's O-O-H, which is out of home. Is that right? Yeah, out of home is an expression used a lot in uh, the parcel delivery business. So, and it's also used in the media. I only found out afterwards, it's also used in the media business, in, in digital, uh, outdoor adver- of <laughs> out of, uh, in advertising, actually. Oh, okay. They call yeah, it out, yeah, of ho- yeah. out of home formats, which are any advertising you see outside the home. But out of home in the in the parcel delivery industry, it basically means other ways of delivering parcels other than to 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 your home. If you've ordered something online, it's about options for uh, delivering to say a corner store, an alternative location, uh, to a parcel locker, which is taking hold in a lot of uh, countries now. Uh, other than coming to your home, and it's really, you know, we're all concerned about the environment and sustainability and everything else now, and anybody really. Uh, will notice that there's, you know, up to five delivery vans coming up your street every day now to deliver parcels. Uh, it's it's environmentally, uh, morally and eco- economically unsustainable for that to continue. So really where parcel parcel delivery, as in delivery of or items ordered online, um, will, will go really is towards more consolidation points that'll be convenient to your home where you can pick up your package uh, when you're ready. So... That's where UPAD is. So it's a sustainability, um, you know, it feeds into a lot of agendas uh, in terms of reducing the cost of final mile, what we call the final mile, which is the, de- the delivery from the, the local depot to your home, uh, reducing the cost of that, reducing the carbon footprint of that, uh, creating a more sustainable um, way of receiving your items that are ordered online. But also for small businesses, um, it's a click and collect option. So if you're a small business selling online, that's, uh, you know, we estimate that there's 50 to 60,000. Uh, you said that to me and I was amazed. Yeah. Listen, there's so many sellers now that sell, uh, products on that's uh, what they call social commerce now, which is they're just, they don't even have a, a website to sell on, on Facebook and so on. We estimate it's 50 to 60,000 dollars in Ireland. Where did you get that number? Uh, I'd have to ask my marketing people because they're the guys that are telling me, um, uh, to, that's but, the, but it's that's coming the, out of like it's well sourced. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, I mean, obviously, we've, we're putting our money behind it because we 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 would estimate that that is. And that's everybody from that sells gadgets and widgets from their from their home. And most of these sellers, uh, their online uh, presence or their online activity in terms of selling products are uh, uh, is not actually their main source of employment. So they would have a day job and then they. It's called a side hustle. And in fact, some of the side American companies... Be an Americanism for it, yeah. yeah the yeah. Americans love it. And yeah. they encourage you, Microsoft and some of the others, I think, say you're a better employee if you have something outside. I'm assuming that a Parcel Motel has, because when you're running it, you probably made sure it had some of the best real estate, best locations. Where are you going to find better or as good locations? Yeah, so that's a good question. Uh, so Parcel Motel are very much at public locations, as we call them. So they're at petrol stations and convenience stores. Uh, Upad is a, we have a, a slightly different business model. So some of our locations will be at public locations like uh, supermarkets, petrol stations, convenience stores. So there's still plenty of those left that don't have a Parcel Motel outside them. But we're also uh, targeting uh, corporate uh, offices and campuses for to, to manage parcels for arriving for employees, uh, you know, for personal items that uh, employees might have ordered personally. We're also education facilities, campus, and um, also re- you know, retailers themselves will you will have um, UPod lockers for their own click and collect orders. And then there's also a very important market for us as well as private residential developments, particularly apartment developments where. Residents would have an issue with uh, parcels arriving, being left in the lobby, and so on. Um, so uh, that's an important. There, there'll be important locations for us as well. So it's a slightly different model to Parcel Motel. And the business model: do the do you pay the say the supermarkets, or does the supermarket pay you, or what is it? Yeah, there's a number again. There's a number of different models. So, for example, if it goes into a private setting, if a locker goes into a private setting for exclusive and private use, the corporate or the private residential development would pay a rental for the have the locker there if it's in a public setting it could either be the consumer uh subscribes to pay uh, directly for the service uh or the uh, we do a mixture of a private location and mixed public and private use with a revenue share model so we have a number of different models so for example our first uh, location to go live was actually in jonesborough in northern ireland which is right on the border 
That's got such a history of trading. It's a fascinating know, place. Yeah. It's where everybody back in the, when we mentioned earlier, 80s yeah. and 90s, we all went up there to buy our bangers, our booze, and I'm sure lots of other things. Yeah, my parents used to go there for some reason to buy like butter. I can remember my parents uh, buying there was a boxes there, of there, I think, yeah. very gold butter. So yeah. it was Irish butter, but they were... Uh, I think there was something about subsidies that if you if, if the butter was sold across the border... Uh, look at... There yeah. was but I, anyway, but look, dodge. Jones for a great place and uh, we've opened a, 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 st- a store there, what we call a Pudo store, which just means pick up and drop off. And so uh, customers uh, can order online, have delivered to Jones for a and uh, can it's 50 minutes from Dublin Airport. It's not as far away as Newry. It's just off Junction 20 on the M1. And so they can have their orders delivered there, and uh, they can go and pick up. And we've got a fitting room and everything in the store there. So I saw this. That's fascinating. And you can, if you don't, it doesn't fit, you just put it back in again. You can bust, just uh, leave it there, and we'll have the courier come and take it back. Uh, to the Who's tall, whose big idea was that? Uh, my COO, Orla Shields, who was uh, previously the general manager of Paris Motel, uh, Bursting with so many entrepreneurial ideas, and uh, she was re- ready to try. So she, this was her idea, and the whole design concept and so on. The store is mostly her idea. Because I did have, going back some years, one of the big catalog people in studio with me when I was on radio, and I remember always remember this that whatever the company was, they had eight hundred people working on returns just on shoes. Yeah, it's. It's a, it's a business in itself, yeah. an industry in itself. Well, yeah, it's what we, the industry would call reverse logistics, but it is a, a huge phenomenon in that uh, about 30% of everything bought online gets returned to the retailer. And it's, it's a huge thing in the, re, in the UK because most retailers in the UK offer free delivery and free returns. So people will buy two pairs of shoes and pick the size or the color they want and return the one they don't want. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a well-established practice. So... We have the fitting room there, sort of. If somebody has ordered something online, and you know, particularly uh, more expensive items, you can make a big saving on fees, on shipping, and possibly a better range of products when they're ordering on UK websites. And that means that they can go there, go to the fitting room, and our our staff there, Nadine and Maureen, are very helpful. It's there. relatively hands on from what you're doing. Yeah, it is, and uh, we also, but outside the Pudo store at Jones, where we have. Uh, a parcel locker system. So most of the parcels that arrive in Jonesbury go into the parcel locker. So the customer gets a text to come and pick it up so they can come any time of the day or night then to collect it, you know. And where are those deliveries normally coming from? Are they coming from the UK? They're coming from uh, UK online retailers, yeah. Okay, so, so you pop across over to Jonesboro mm. and just drive over. Or just drive there and it's particularly, it's very... No, I mean drive back again as Or well. just drive back again. It's, it's cross-border shopping. Yeah. The same as going to Asda for your... Your weekly shop. So a lot of no, people in that part of the world do. Yeah. No VAT or anything. No, and you're avoiding you're avoiding uh, the customs uh, VAT okay. duty because yeah. of the UK being outside of the European Union, now. Exactly. and you're also avoiding fees because there's a lot of fees around when when you when a courier arrives to your door to collect VAT duty and something. There's also administration fees. So. On post is now charging three euro fifty because I just paid it the other day. Yeah, or as a fee on top a of fee the on top of everything else. Duty. And, and and David McRedmond, uh, the CEO of On Post, actually sp- uh, spoke at a major conference in Copenhagen this week that I attended. And uh, he's still making a, a very strong point about the amount of parcels that arrive in Ireland from the UK that have to be returned because they don't have the right, correct uh, customs paperwork or classifications and so on. And he actually made the point that 50, there's been a 50% drop in the amount of mail and parcels from the UK to Ireland because of the customs complexities and so on and so forth. So look, this uh, cross border, it's just, you know, uh, if you have it ordered, delivered to Jonesbury and you go cross border to pick it up, you're making a cross border shopping trip essentially. It's the same as going to Asda or going to Sainsbury's and Uri and you're collecting it there and you're avoiding all of that, either the delays or the disappointment of a parcel being returned to the UK and then also the fees that are, might be associated with it. Jonesboro was first. Now where are you? So Jonesboro is first and it's really a Jones was really appealing to people that live near the border, um, and uh, it's, it's quite a common, you know, quite a, an already established practice. Of people cross border shopping that live quite near there or anywhere really north from North Dublin or Dublin up to the border. Um, the CSO f- stats that say that twenty percent of uh, the population of Dublin make a reg- make a regular cross border shopping trip. So it's really the cro- the passing traffic that we're trying to appeal to there that they might okay. uh, while they're doing a cross border. And where else are you going to go? 
Okay, so we've got, uh, we'll have another uh, at least 40 locations in Northern Ireland. Uh, 40, 4 zero. Four zero, yeah. By oh, when? Uh, by the end of this year. You're going to be busy. And uh, then we've another 50 planned for, for Dublin that we'll roll out over the next few months. There's already, we've already put one, we've already got a new pod at the Super Value in Randalla. And we've got one at the Parkright in the IFSC in Dublin. So we'll, and people will start to see them a lot more now. But we just thought the, the Jonesboro one, to get that up and running quickly, would you know, would solve a problem and it would be yeah. a talking point and it would be something that uh, customers might, well, be, hopefully might build some traction. listeners to the podcast would be talking about it because I did not know about it. So that's really interesting. And as you say, solving a problem. You're listening to That Great Business Show. ThatGreatBusinessShow.com Thinking of travel? If so, make sure to make de facto the world's best shaving oil your choice of travel companion. A 25 milliliter bottle of de facto means no hassle at airports, no bulky cans to carry, and the guarantee of the world's best shave. DeFactoShave.com. Small businesses often find it difficult to access the finance they need. Microfinance Ireland, the government funded, not for profit lender, can help. We help businesses who've been unable to secure finance from banks or other lenders. We provide business loans up to €25,000 to businesses of less than 10 employees with a turnover of up to €2 million. Euro. For more information, visit microfinanceireland.ie or talk to your local enterprise office. Microfinance Ireland, funding small businesses in times of recovery and opportunity. Everyday accounting can be a bit of a drama for SMEs. However, BigRentCloud.com takes the drama away with its simple and easy-to-use cloud-based accounting and payroll software designed for SME owners. Raise and send invoices, manage VAT reports and obligations, run management reports, link directly to Irish banks, automatically import purchase invoices, and so much more. All with five-star customer support. BigRentCloud.com, 100% Irish-owned and a proud member of Team GBS. All that great business show advertisers are Team GBS approved. Back them. Now, the size of the pods themselves, oh, how big a, a, a box or a item can I put into them? Um, the largest, I mean, the largest locker in the, in the U-Pod uh, system would take, a, a, you know, a small microwave boxed up kind of thing. That would be the, the size of the channel. And the largest item we'll accept in Jonesboro is about the size of a wheelie bin, about a, a quarter, 0.25 of a cubic meter. So. So uh, customers will use them for all sorts, uh, you know, even for you know a bicycle or a flat screen TV. Would you get a bike into it? We won't get a bike into the locker, but we have the store in Jonesboro, so we'll have items that won't fit in the locker. They can pick up from the store. Okay, Lar- larger items, you know. And then, what's the world view? What are you going to do after that? Now, can you get into more rural areas? Um, the, the the appeal for parcel lockers tends to be in more urban areas, but certainly, I would see. As a, as you know, as I've seen in other countries in Europe, where centralized at a, at a, a you know at a centralized hub or a, or a local village, a parcel locker uh, will be the way, so that people will uh, travel in there to do their shopping and pick up their probably even their mail and their parcels. So, it could, it having a you know having a delivery to uh, rural addresses every day, even for the for the postal service, is going to be a real challenge. To keep it going economically. So, I think in other European countries, I've seen particularly in Germany, for example, where they'll put a parcel locker in the local village or at the local uh, post office or store, and that's where people will come to pick up the parcels. You eat, breathe, and sleep lockers and parcels, don't you? I really do, you know, and uh, I've become... <laughs> I, 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 went to the, I, I went to the parcel, uh, that conference, which was a, the Leaders in Logistics Conference in, uh, in Copenhagen earlier in the week. I got there on Sunday because the way the flights were working. And the first thing I did was uh, go out and walk around Copenhagen to see if I could see parcel lockers and see what they looked like and what the local uh, the local scene was like. But it, in in Scandinavia and in the Baltic countries, uh, there's huge investment going into this whole area, and uh, there's hundreds of millions in capital being invested in it. Um, in the Baltic states, for example, uh, Estonia, um, there's more than ninety percent now of, their, of all items ordered online are delivered via uh, parcel locker. So it really is a, a future when it comes to uh, e-commerce. You know? So you're doing obviously a land grab in Ireland. Can you go abroad? No, we've we've international expansion plans. I mean, we've registered the UPOD trademark. Uh, we've registered that trademark worldwide. Do you call it U or U? U. U. UPOD, okay. Uh, we, 
We registered, we have the trademark registered worldwide. We have about 200 high level domains registered. So we're ready to take over the world. Um, and then you need funds. And did I see an old colleague of mine called Declan McGee working with you on funds? Maybe yeah. you don't know that he was uh, an old colleague. He worked with me and read the stock progress uh, a while ago. I didn't know that. I'll, there you I'll, go. I'll mention it to Declan. Uh, yeah, Declan <laughs> McGee and Mike Perrick, they're both formerly Elkstone Ventures. Uh, so they helped me with the, uh, the seed round to get that away, which last September. And we'll be preparing now to go for further funding round. The thing about parcel lockers is, while it's a tech business, you know, it's referred to as urban logistics and last mile tech and this kind of stuff. Uh, it is quite capital intensive because the machines themselves are quite expensive. And, um, they, you know, so it is to roll it out. You need one, one thing you need to make a lot of money for parcel lockers is a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> well, we won't. I know the standard thing is how do you make a large for a big small fortune by having a large one to start with. Yeah. So, per say per location, are we talking about ten thousand quid, a hundred thousand quid? No, per location, that's more like about twenty thousand euro. Okay, but when I when I was rolling out Paris and Hotel in the year early in twenty twelve, uh, that we would have been about double that. So the price is halved, but it's still a lot of money. You know, uh, when you have to do so many, yeah. Yeah. so each each location, and we we're buying this equipment in China. And uh, it's the shipping cost from China has uh, uh, gone up exponentially. And then the cost of commodities, copper and all this materials that go into making them um, is, uh, has gone up as well. So they're around 20,000 per location. Um, so that's why we have to be very choosy about where we put them and make sure that somebody's... And if you've got 50 locations here and 50 in Northern Ireland uh, planned, yeah, by the year end, will you have 100 done? Or um, Yeah, we'd be quite, quite hopeful of that. And uh, I mean, I think Ireland, uh, you know, they say, you know, to, to get density in, par, in, par, in parcel locker networks, uh, it's you'd go with about one to uh, you know five thousand of population to be optimized. So I mean, you know, we we I'd easily see that Ireland can take a thousand of these over the next few years. You know, except that we have a pretty widespread, uh, widely spread population outside of Dublin. Yeah, and do you, so when you're back into small towns again, I, I heard what you said about it'll be. The central would be like going. I don't know the what 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 was the the local pub uh, might become the local parcel locker. Yeah, no, I, I think that will be. I think what will happen is because if you think about it, a rural residence or anybody's residence, whether it's rural, rural or urban, you have a number of services arriving at your house every day. So you've got your mail, and you'll have couriers or various probably couriers. You've got teenage children like I have. Uh, you've probably got various couriers or children in their early twenties arriving at the door every day. And then you might order your, your groceries online as well. So to me, the future of this is that that will be consolidated and it will be a local service that will take your, your parcels, your mail and your groceries from a from sort of a local hub, which is a village or town, right, to, to your home. I think those consolidation is, is what has to happen there. We really have listened, again, listened to David McRedmond, uh, the CEO of Unpost, who's really... I hope coming on to the podcast in the next... Some weeks time. I listen. Uh, I it was a two day conference there um, in Copenhagen. We had speakers from all over the world and some of the most uh, you know prominent people in the postal industry. His presentation was easily the most impressive. So we're Good very man, very David. lucky to have him. You know. Good. But his point is that we need to reduce consumption and reduce the amount of miles driven to, if we we're going to have any impact on you know the carbon footprint of uh, of consumption basically. So that's really about reducing the amount of miles. So if you think about a parcel locker and a courier arriving there or the postman arriving there uh, with 10 parcels, that means he can drop 10 parcels at one point rather than go to 10 individual residences. And I think everybody probably has already started noticing that there's so many couriers now, uh, courier vans on residential streets and that there's air quality issues there, there's noise, there's risk because you've got your children out playing on streets and all the rest of it. A lot of the a lot of the couriers operating now in you know, it's just not just in Ireland but internationally in the UK and so on, they're gig economy workers. Uh the chances are they've bought a second hand van that's more than ten years old. So they're 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 polluting, they're um they're carbon emitting and all the rest of it. So that's not sustainable going forward. And particularly now with the price of fuel and so on, um consolidation will have to play a role. That's a good pitch. Now, two more things I have to ask you. Just uh, crossed my mind because I did see it, I think, on your website that you are looking at chilled con- chilled um, boxes or chilled containers. That c- could be very interesting for which business? 
So the, the yeah, so the the technology we've invested in is not just the, not just parcel lockers as such. We have that are just ambient temperature. You know, they, they, there's no refrigeration or anything going on. We can also add chilled and frozen compartments. Um, those are more of a specialized sale. We'll be pointing those really at uh, uh, retailers uh, for click and collect orders of grocery items, which is a you know a, a growing area. And then we also have long, what we call laundry pods or boot cleans, which have a you know a hang just basically they're long and narrow and they have a, you can hang garments in them so they can be used for laundry and and dry cleaning. And then we have a we have a we have a a drop pod, a drop box, which is good for recyclables and returned items and, and so on. So we have a number of different, uh, we've uh, set up a, a demonstration area showroom at our headquarters in Airways, let's just say near the airport, uh, Dublin airport. And uh, so we can demonstrate all the capabilities there. So, but the grocery ones are more, they're, in, they're you know, parcel lockers are expensive. Grocery lockers are even more expensive because you can imagine the technology has to be involved in keeping frozen and chilled and all that. So they're more of a specialised sale, and we're trying to attract the interest of some of the major supermarkets and those. And but you're already you told me in Super Value. Is the, the the first one in the one of the first machines yeah is located at Super Value in Ranla, so it's yeah. outside and it's for parcels. Okay. So for so for the Super Value there, but you've already obviously made a contact there. I know it's uh, yeah yeah no that that arrangement. Uh, with Super Value actually was through our partnership with Apcoa, the car parking people. I know so, them, yes. so Apcoa are uh, Apcoa and all of the car park operators are looking for ways to. Uh, I can't say I love them. <laughs> <laughs> you do, I'm sure. They well, all car park operators, even including internationally, are looking for ways to uh, diversify their okay. away and use their real estate. So Apcoa, the introduction to Super Value in Ranla was through Apcoa because they managed the the car park there. You know what the final question we always ask all our guests, because I, I'm going to have you back because we haven't even, I knew this was going to happen. I wanted to talk to you about your business, yeah. but I also at some stage want to talk to you about the backstory yeah. because it's a brilliant story. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we'll get you back some other time. Who would John Tooley hire in a heartbeat? I think that would have to be Vladimir Zelensky. Jeez, for a second, I thought you were going to say the other Vladimir. No, <laughs> his one, they're spelled slightly <laughs> different ways, aren't they? It must be a, the Ukrainian spelling versus a <laughs> Russian spelling, but it's a uh, similar sounding, but definitely, what a leader, what a what a man, um, uh, you know, to to really uh, uh, show strength, courage, leadership. I, I really can't think of anyone I admire anymore at, at the moment. You know, an incredible backstory to him as well. Yeah. Like he wasn't taken seriously. A comedy actor, and then when what's that great phrase? Cometh the hour, cometh the man. Yeah, and he's obviously proven and he himself. Really, he really filled his boots, didn't he? You know? Oh, big time! Yeah. So yeah, he wouldn't mind yeah. if he wants to come on to this podcast at any stage. Yeah. Hopefully, when they have got rid of their invaders. But couldn't you imagine his those uh, those leadership skills in any business? Uh, he'd be oh, phenomenal, fantastic. As, as, yeah. as many political leaders, I think you know, they, if they yeah. were in the in business life, they would be hugely successful people. Well, John Tuhi of Upod, double O H P O D. First of all, you're looking for people to take in your Upods. Yeah. So if anybody wants to contact you, they will find you where? Upod.com. Yeah. And, Simple uh, as. Nice website as well. Oh, thanks a lot. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah. So, uh, and they, you are literally open for business. We sure are. John Tuhi, founder of Upod, thank you so much for joining us on That Great Business Show. And that's it from That Great Business Show, episode 80. Please share, like, retweet this podcast with all your connections on social media. And do it now, please, before you forget. It's a click of a button for you. It's commercial success for us. Make it easy on yourself to enjoy your favorite business podcast by also pressing the subscribe button. And of course, you can always talk to us on our LinkedIn page. Great brands like Big Red Cloud, Microfinance Ireland, Is Me, Virgin Media, Udrasnagadukta and others advertise with us. They're all Team GPS approved. So please give them your commercial backing. And if your business would like to advertise on what you say is Ireland's best business podcast, do get in touch with us today. As always, my thanks to all the team here at the Dublin Podcast Studios, including today's sound engineer, Dennis. I was going to call you Dennis, David, or David. We always have this chat about it. 
He's got a very interesting spelling. It's kind of David, but it's not allowed to say David, so we just call him David Murray. Thank you, David. Later, Peter Rice will add some extra long whooshes to the show. Listen out for them and to the new bits and pieces that we're dropping in this week as they help make us the world's best sounding podcast. The Dublin Podcast Studios are open for business. If you want to make a podcast, check out the new website and then have a chat with Peter. As always, the great business insights you hear on That Great Business Show are only made possible thanks to our sponsor, the great makers of the world's best shaving oil, Defecto, made in Mayo, sold worldwide. And don't forget to buy Business Plus magazine, where we now have a regular column. And that's it me from me, Conal Moran. Mirabuchas for listening. Agus Tamil.